Well, good afternoon and welcome. So welcome in particular to all our uh, Yahoo Finance Plus subscribers. Thanks for joining us today to all our listeners. This is Argus Director of Research, Jim Kelleher. Our topic today is the financial service sector and what the outlook is in this environment of rising rates and a newly active Federal Reserve. We're being joined today by Argus President John Ede, Director of Financial Services Research Stephen Bigger, and Senior Analyst and Fixed Income Strategist Kevin Heal. To get a little idea of what we're going to talk about today, consider that after nearly two years of ultra-accommodative policy designed to strengthen the domestic economy during the COVID shutdowns, the Federal Reserve has executed a 180-degree turn toward restrictive monetary policy. Some investors see the Fed as being behind the curve, given the multi-decade highs in inflation we were experiencing even before the Russian sanctions. The central bank is responding with a multi-pronged approach, which includes a rapid unwinding of quantitative easing, plans to wind down the Fed's bloated balance sheet, and a series of rate hikes. So the war in Ukraine has distracted investors from inflation related issues, but they certainly have not gone away. With Russian sanctions causing almost unprecedented energy price inflation, the pressure may now, may now mount on the Fed to rethink its aggressive shift. Uh, it's certainly a dynamic situation, and that's something that um, Kevin and Steve will talk about in, in detail. Kevin believes the Fed will implement a 25 basis point hike in Fed funds rate at the FOMC meeting next week. He does believe the Fed will hike rates four times at least in 2022. I'll let, I'll let Kevin tell you about what he thinks is ahead. Steve Bigger believes the rising rate environment, while currently challenging to the stock market overall, could prove beneficial to sector stocks with higher interest rates helping net interest margins and a robust employment environment. Uh, loan growth is solid and credit costs are still low. Steve believes select banks are well positioned for healthy earnings growth this year. And he's particularly focused on banks with good diversification, a strong service territory, and merger synergies. So we'll hear Stephen and Kevin uh, offer their best ideas for this still evolving environment. Argus President John Ede is here, and he has some interesting perspective on where Russia is situated in the global economy and some of the sectors that are likely to benefit from, as, as, as we said, a very dynamic environment that's unfolding uh, right before our eyes. So let's um, talk a little bit about uh, what we have in front of us. These charts, I'm actually going to, we have a lot to get to today, so I'm going to move through these charts kind of quickly. Uh, in terms of where we are on GDP, we had 7% GDP growth uh, in the fourth quarter, capped by, that capped a year in which GDP grew more than 5%. We have a slow start to 2022 with all these factors floating around. The Atlanta Fed's uh, GDP now forecaster is about half percent growth in first quarter GDP. Argus is a little bit above that, but our our estimates are also uh, moving as we speak. We, you know, we, one reason we're above the the Fed's the uh, Atlanta Fed's consensus is the highly encouraging non-farm payrolls and ADP private jobs data. At the same time, inflation is gnawing at consumer and business confidence. So our GDP forecast for this year is closer to 3.2%, followed by growth of about 2.5% in 2023. Now that's obviously we're in a lower GDP growth trajectory, but that even 2.5% will be better than the 2% growth prevailing for the 10 years preceding the pandemic. In terms of our yield curve discussion on the prior page, I'll leave that to Kevin and, and Steve. Uh, if we get back to the prior slide, uh, yeah, right. No, there we go. I, I'll just point out in that upper right slide that pink current uh, yield curve shows that it's quite flattening out quite dramatically. And so for that reason, that's a, something to keep an eye on for inflation. I'm sorry, for recession hawks. Um, I'll mention S&P earnings growth that we did raise our estimates for 2021 based on a strong fourth quarter finish that led us to raise our estimates for 2022 and to 2024. Um, to, I'm sorry, to 2022 and 2023. We're looking for something like 50% EPS growth for 2021, followed by a more normal uh, 9%, uh, 8 to 9% growth in the next two years. It's a little bit above average, but closer to normal. The, I, I mention this simply because rising earnings in a down market means that the extremely overvalued situation we had at year-end 2021 is easing a little bit, but John, I think we'd still say we're 
in an overvalued market here. Uh, Argus rebalances its sector recommendations um, every uh, every quarter, and we recently made some changes in our, our market based on a very disciplined uh, approach, a quantitative approach that also has some qualitative inputs. Our recommended sector weightings are as follows. We recommend overweights in energy, healthcare, industrials, financial services, one of the, our focus sector today, and materials. We have market weights in technology, utilities, consumer discretionary, and REITs. And we have recommended underweights in staples and communication services. Um, on the next page, uh, just to see, there's lots of red on the screen. Uh, for many years, we've had nothing but green on the screen. You can see the energy is the lone outperforming sector. Uh, and and uh, there's hardly any positive news on the, on the performance front, except Brazil, a, a pure play commodity, economy that's not caught up in European drama uh, is outperforming the market. So let's move on to our two uh, special slides, as it were. We're possibly in the ending stages of 2020's uh, black swan event. And of course, that was the COVID-19 pandemic in 2020. We're not getting in relief as the war in the Ukraine has emerged as a second black swan event in two years. We offer this caveat while sharing that average performance in a rising rate environment and average bear market performance without making any predictions in what is an extremely volatile environment. In terms of stock market performance in periods of uh, Fed rate interest cycles, that's the, the chart at the bottom of the page. The Fed has engaged in six meaningful rate height cycles since 1980. These occurred in 83, 84, 88, 89, 93, 95, 1999 through 2000, 2004 through 2006. 2016 2019 on average they lasted about 19 months and the fed fund rate at the end of the cycle averaged about 3.8 percent the average change over the cycle was a cumulative hike of 300 basis points and i think we'll hear from kevin today what he thinks the cumulative change will be in this uh, upcoming cycle stocks perform better knowing that hikes are coming they're up about 6.3 percent on average in the six months before the cycle begins than they do when it actually begins, they are up about 4.8% in the six months after the first uh, rate hike. Performance across the cycle is an average gain of 14% across the 19 months, and that works out to an annualized gain of 9%. Of, of 9 so that's a little less than the average annual return of 10.7% in the S&P 500 since 1980, but it's not too much below that average. So we would say in a nutshell, a rising rate environment does not usually crush the stock market, but it does impact performance. Now, bear markets are on everyone's mind these days. Um, we could say the NASDAQ has been dipping its toes into bear territory in the past few days, and we'll see if it stays there or if we can bounce back up. The market does tend to experience more near bear markets than true bear markets. Over the past 50 years, Argus counts seven true bear markets, and those are uh, illustrated in our chart on top of the page. Uh, these bear market declines have averaged about 41%, and they've been lengthy, lasting about 16 months. If we exclude the very, very short COVID bear market, which was really only a, a less than two months, the duration on average is really about 20 months. Now, near bear markets, which we don't show in our chart, they're associated with secular transitions that prove to be transitory, things the market and the economy have gotten used to. You know, we count uh, um, near bear markets and... Uh, 1990, 98, 2011, 2015, and 2018. These bear, near bears last a shorter time, uh, more like about four months or 128 days, and the average decline has been more like 18%, not that deep, 41%. Now, the true bear markets have generally been associated with major events such as the collapse of the dot-com boom and 9-11 in the 2002-02 in the period, or the Great Recession in 2008-09. No one can predict how events will play out in Ukraine uh, and Europe at this point. Assuming some sort of agreement, truce, whatever stasis is reached and that the worst the market has to deal with is inflation in a, blue, in a booming demand environment, that would normally be a recipe for more of a near bear than a really deep bear market. But of course, it's a dynamic situation and we'll continue to monitor it. Okay, at this point, I'd like to turn the call over to Kevin talk a little bit about what he thinks the Fed has in mind and where we go from here, and then he will in turn hand it off to Steve to talk about some of the stocks in the sector. Kevin? Uh, thank you, Jim. Uh, welcome, everyone. Um, as Jim had mentioned uh, earlier in the call, 
at Argus, uh, we expect four rate hikes for 2022. Uh, the market right now is pricing in between four and potentially seven rate hikes in the uh, in 2022. We believe the Fed will be taking a more measured approach. You saw some earlier talk from other Fed governors about a, the potential for a 50 basis point hike in March once the uh, Russia inv invasion of Ukraine occurred. Um, the odds of that went from potentially like 50% up to 95% uh, that will be one rate hike. And uh, in Chairman Powell's recent testimony to Congress, uh, he made the unusual step of basically stating that, yes, we're going to ra raise rates 25 basis points in March. Um, we're looking, you know, we think the Fed will take this longer term measured approach just due to not wanting to stall out any any GDP growth. Um, you've see, as Jim had mentioned, you've seen a, a real uh, flattening of the yield curve where the twos ten spread has got had gotten low as uh, 20 basis points. Uh, I believe it was yesterday. Um, so you know you have this kind of dichotomy where short term rates are have moved up dramatically, but the longer end of the curve has stayed within that 170 to two percent range. Um, while the two-year has moved from 50 basis points all the way up to 1.5% uh, right now. So, and in, in looking into 2023, we anticipate three more rate hikes and um, taking us back to that pre-pandemic level of 175 to, to two. Um, and we do anticipate some more rate hikes in 2024. Um, that might end up as the, the average, as was mentioned earlier, that the average rate hikes are about 300 basis points. That could get us up above that, could get us to that 3%, closer to that 3% level uh, in rate hikes by the end of 2024. Um, the Fed uh, is, is concerned about a flattening yield curve, often a uh, precursor to a recession. The last one inverted yield curve we had was in 2000. Six, which led to the recession in 2007, eight, and nine. Um, there's been discussions at uh, the at the last Fed meeting about how to reduce the balance sheet. It's grown from 3.8 trillion to it's just about to hit 8.9 uh, trillion. Of that, the uh, Treasury had sold off their corporate bond portfolio, which is relatively small, their ETF portfolio, they sold all, the, all that off in the summer of 2021. So currently they're holding just treasuries at about 6.2 trillion and their MBS or mortgage-backed securities holdings stand right now at 2.7 trillion. They're doing their last uh, $30 billion purchase in March. Um, and then, so the anticipation is, is that we could either do some passive uh, quantitative tightening or QT and letting the treasuries and MBS uh, prepayments mature and not reinvest the proceeds. But we believe the Fed will take a more active approach and sell off the uh, entire MBS holdings over a period of time. The mortgage-backed securities duration at the, when rates were substantially much lower um, was about three years in the duration. It's currently up around now seven to eight years in a duration. So this would help, selling these MBS holdings would help steepen out the longer end of the curve. Anticipate probably between 50 and 100 billion per month. It could be start at 50 and then work its way up at higher as long as, but the Fed doesn't really want to upset the market and doesn't want to upset the housing market, um, but it would help steepen the yield curve and make sure that we don't have an inverted yield curve. Now, I pass it over to Steve Bigger. Okay, uh, thanks, Kevin, and uh, appreciate you all listening in today. Um, so I'd like to go over with uh, with you an outlook for banks. Now, as uh, Jim mentioned, we have been overweight uh, on the financial services uh, sector uh, for all of last year. Uh, and um, the sector uh, generally has, has done very, very well. Uh, in 2021, the S&P was up 27%. Financials are up 33%. Uh, regional banks did even better, up 37%. And uh, diversified banks are up 31, a little less than the sector, uh, but uh, well ahead of the S&P. Um, year to date, 
little different story, obviously. The S&P is down 12%. Uh, financials are down 9%, though still uh, ahead of the market. So, you know, when we think about the uh, the outlook for banks uh, in the next year, even two years, um, obviously one of the positive drivers for banks would be, as Kevin mentioned, our expectation for three to more likely four uh, Fed funds rate increases this year, and then another three to four next year. Um, longer dated yields uh, also, um, you know, have risen already. They have backtracked uh, more recently, of course, with the Ukraine-Russia crisis, but um, we still expect a, a steep yield, yield curve. Uh, and even if long rates uh, don't cooperate uh, as much as we'd like, the uh, the Fed funds increases will still uh, be a, a very nice benefit for banks because about a third of, of loans outstanding are, are tied uh, to short-term rates, uh, things like adjustable mortgages, home equity loans, uh, you know, corporate lending, a lot of things that are tied to the prime rate, which goes up immediately uh, up or down as the uh, Fed funds uh, rate moves. Uh, so that's going to be beneficial for our net interest margins. Um, also, you know, we think about loan growth, uh, which was really uh, didn't go uh, anywhere uh, during the pandemic. Uh, in fact, a lot of loans were, were paid down. Uh, so loan balances uh, have begun to grow again. They really uh, took a nice uh, tick upward in the fourth quarter uh, of last year. So we're seeing a really continued improvement on that. Um, most of which we attribute to just good economic uh, growth, recovery in, in GDP, jobs growth, people feeling more confident. Uh, about their their prospects and about uh, buying, uh, whether it's uh, housing or houses or or autos, uh, home improvement projects and the like. So, uh, and also a roll off of of government stimulus, which uh, many banks had attributed the the weakness there. Uh, customers were a bit bit flush with cash. Obviously, you couldn't you couldn't travel. You couldn't do a lot of different uh, things. So, uh, loans were were certainly uh, under pressure in the early going of the pandemic. Um, and then thirdly, uh, good credit costs. Uh, you know, the, the script was was basically flipped um, in this latest uh, downturn. We had uh, spiked to 15% in unemployment in the early days of the pandemic. Normally, you would expect to see a, a real uh, shock to uh, credit costs there, delinquencies, net charge-offs. Um, but because of the uh, government stimulus efforts and, and how brief the, um, the downturn was, uh, credit costs actually uh, moved lower. Uh, throughout the course of the cycle. They remain uh, very much at, at cycle lows here. Uh, and also the strong uh, rebound in employment obviously has helped um, tremendously. There is probably no better correlation in banking uh, than between uh, credit costs and employment. So if, if consumers have a job, uh, they will keep current on their, on their uh, lending and borrowing. Uh, and if uh, there's a downturn in employment, they have difficulty either uh, replacing a job if they lost one, um, and uh, that you know clearly is uh, is is bad for the repayment cycle. So we expect a, a continued elongation of of low credit costs here. Uh, and then I would also point out uh, capital returns from the um, the upcoming uh, CCAR uh, cycle. This is where the Fed approves the uh, bank dividend and buyback uh, plans that comes out in uh, June, and um, in 2020, of course, we had a complete moratorium on, on dividends and buybacks as the uh, banks were uh, holding capital uh, because of the downturn. And uh, that was loosened, obviously, in 2021. We had some some good um, dividend increases and buybacks uh, there. And we expect more of the same uh, when it comes to the mid-year 2022 uh, cycle, uh, certainly as we are on the, the precipice of a, a two-year rate height cycle. Uh, and then lastly, I'd point out the sector is, is still relatively inexpensive on a historical price to earnings and price to book uh, value basis. We're trading at roughly uh, 12 times PEs now uh, versus 14 during the rate height cycle. So that's about a close to a 20% uh, discount uh, and um, offering really good yields as banks have moved up um, on the payout ratios. Um, we're looking at uh, two and a half to three, even three and a half percent yields here. There are risks, however. Um, inflation, as uh, as Jim mentioned, uh, right now is is quite high. Uh, that's a bit of a double-edged sword for banks. Of course, it's responsible for raising the uh, interest rates, and that is beneficial. But banks have also uh, cautioned that their expense growth for things like wages, tech spending, um, could also uh, come to bite. We also have um, 
a lot of sensitivity. Uh, banks are interest rate uh, sensitive, of course, so any change to that uh, narrative uh, that, that, that comes up that the Fed may not increase rates as much as we think, um, banks are hypersensitive to, uh, to the rate story. Also, a lot of competition now from fintech. Um, they have uh, really as a force to, uh, you know, this force spend to defend the territory. Uh, FinTech has moved in on areas like lending and traditional checking, payment services. Um, so banks are, are very much aware of that and, uh, and spending a lot to um, keep ahead of that competition. Um, we also expect a short-term slowdown in, in investment banking activity here due to the Russian conflict. Uh, typically when you have these uh, sharp moves lower, uh, in the market, it, it causes a uh, pause for uh, M&A activity, IPO activity, and the like. Uh, on the flip side, however, trading, uh, this is sort of custom made for banks, This uh, these large repositioning trades that we're seeing between equities, fixed income, currency, commodities, they're, they're just all uh, very volatile, and uh, that's beneficial for trading activities at banks, so we'll make up uh, for some of that uh, lightness and in, in, the capital markets, uh, other areas of capital markets. Uh, and then lastly, availability of funding in, in short-term rate markets and, and currencies could is a risk as well. So let's look at a couple of uh, favorite picks here. Um, and uh, as Jim mentioned earlier, you know, we, we like the regional bank space and that's the focus uh, here in particular. They're uh, more pure plays to the rising interest rate story. Um, and in addition to having uh, a good service territory, having a good balance sheet that's, uh, that is asset sensitive, meaning it will benefit from higher rates, um, we also look for catalysts in these uh, regional banks. And what we've uh, focused on here uh, today would be PNC Financial Services that uh, does have that well diversified territory. It's got a great management team, um, good underwriting. Uh, that's very important uh, through the cycle. So great credit risk profile here. Uh, mid last year, they acquired the uh, U.S. arm of Banco Bilbao Vizcaya, um, so that that provided a very nice geographic expansion, particularly in, in the Sunbelt region, which is a, a faster growing uh, service territory than than the United States as a whole. Um, looking there for uh, a little over 20% earnings accretion this year, and that was due to an all cash purchase price. Uh, and they were able to do that because they used uh, funds from the sale of uh, BlackRock. BNC had a large stake in uh, BlackRock, the asset management firm, and uh, sold that. Also expecting some good cost savings uh, throughout throughout that franchise's uh, target price here of 245. Uh, next up is Truist Financial. Uh, this company is the, the merger between BB&T and SunTrust. Uh, so terrific uh, overlap in, in service territories there. Um, we uh, we did see about 65% of, of the 1.6 billion in merger savings achieved by the end of last year. Uh, and they've got uh, really strong medium term goals here. Are we above 20% uh, efficiency in the low 50s? Uh, that really places them in the, the top uh, echelons of, of regional banks. Uh, so good growth prof profile here, great revenue diversification. They have insurance operations. And um, <clears throat> so, Above average yield here, uh, and all of that uh, taken together, we think merits a uh, an above average valuation uh, for the bank. Target price here of 77. Next up is U.S. Bank. Um, this all company also uh, levered to uh, rising rates, of course, with a with a nice asset sensitive balance sheet. Uh, we're looking for a substantial uh, margin improvement, basically uh, through all quarters, right through the end of of next year. Um, loan growth improvement uh, as well. Uh, management has been um, most recently uh, forecasted mid single digit uh, growth in, in net interest income for, the, for this year. And that's really before the uh, most of the rate hikes uh, kick in and, and benefit uh, the, the margin. Also, uh, just last September, they agreed to acquire U, uh, MUFG's Union Bank, um, core regional bank franchise from Mitsubishi UFJ. Um, so there's a focus there in California, Washington, Oregon that will, will beef up their operations there. About 58 billion in loans being acquired and uh, looking for 8% accretion there uh, when that uh, operation is fully integrated. Target price of 70 for US, US Bank Corp. And then American Express, um, which uh, of course well known for worldwide uh, credit card travel services now. Uh, you know, the, the travel and entertainment categories um, were certainly very hard hit during the pandemic. Uh, cross-border travel um, basically came to a halt. Um, 
uh, so American Express has a uh, large market share here, uh, but on the flip side now also has the biggest potential for uh, rebound in that space. Uh, in fact, uh, having you know covered this company for many, many years, and they do give a pretty good guidance uh, for the year ahead, uh, management came out with a 18 to 20% revenue growth uh, target for 2022. Um, so that that's as, as, as high as it's been in, in, um, since I've been following the company. Uh, so, you know, more than a decade here of, of, of uh, uh, you know, this is a really good number relative to where they've been in, in past years uh, with, with their forecast. Um, also, you think about American Express as customers, a bit higher income. They're also uh, spending faster as the economy re rebounds. Um, and uh, one uh, area where American Express has, has been a bit uh, behind in, in, uh, with the competition has been on merchant acceptance. American Express cards not accepted as uh, ubiquitously as, uh, say, Visa and MasterCard, but they are making progress on, on trying to get to more parity uh, with with those other cards. And um, that's going to be you know, helpful uh, for uh, spending volumes for them as well. Target price here of 200. Uh, and with that, let me turn it back over to Kevin for some of his regional bank picks. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Steve. Um, <clears throat> along with, uh, as, as Steve mentioned before, with the Truist and PNC, uh, Citizens Financial also is expanding along the East Coast and into the Sun Belt region, recently acquired HSBC's branches and online deposit. Um, so that gave them a big, uh, bigger foothold into the, the Florida market where H HSBC had a pretty big presence. Um, also, they've acquired... Um, Investors Bank Corp. Uh, it's a, a Jersey-based bank with, uh, you know, presence in the New York and and especially in New York and Philly markets. That's expected to close this quarter. Um, that will make them a top 10 bank in deposits in that very key New York City metro area. And basically, with the recent acquisitions, they they cover the the entire East Coast. Uh, they also are expanding their investment banking presence as well. Uh, they closed the acquisition of JMP Group, which is a uh, investment bank out of uh, California. Um, they expected to make, if they're going to make any further acquisitions, it would probably be in the wealth management area to expand that presence. Dividend yield pays pretty well for a large regional bank of around 3%, and we have a current target price right now of $60 per share. In the insurance sector, which I cover, um, both cover the both the life and PNC insurers top pick right now is Prudential um, their ROE return on equity is is remains robust at 12 and a half percent well above the uh, peer group that is seeing right now about 10 9 to 10 percent uh, return on equity expanding into higher margin areas such as Africa or the EME areas and they've recently sold um, some insurance uh, subsidiary is in both in Japan and Korea in the lower margin areas. Um, we expect uh, you know, Prudential had experienced some higher COVID-19 morbidity rates, um, especially of those under the age of 40. We expect going forward that they're going to have um, much lower morbidity rates, um, but that will be offset by uh, the volatility we've seen in both in the equity and fixed income and the valuations of their portfolio. Consistently always raising their dividend, recently raised it 4% to a, a buck 20 for a yield of about 4.25%. feel it's quite attractive in the insurance market, one of the highest yields out there for, for a, a, you know, a top insurance company. And we have a target price right now, 128. In the exchange sector cover, favorite pick right now is ICE. Um, over the last couple of years, ICE has, you know, begin to transform themselves from relying less and less upon commissions and to becoming more of a data provider and a service provider. Um, exchange revenue is, makes up just a little over half of the total revenue where it had been about 75, 80%. Their data services and their fixed income pricing service is about 26% of revenue. And the recent purchase in of Ellie May uh, in 2020, um, they expanded their presence into the mortgage technology sector. So the uh, ICE pretty much touches well over 80% of every mortgage, more on the back end and the processing side. Um, they touch about 80, 85% of all U.S. mortgages um, use their ICE technology for mortgages. Um, 
expected to remain st steady here with the, obviously with the increases in energy and agriculture and and commissions on on their uh, equity trades um, that's going to be offset by lower mortgage revenue as we as originations probably will be half of what they were previously with m virtually uh, hardly any refinancings going on it'll be more of a purchase market and also will be offset by uh, at least in the first quarter lower listings revenue or IPOs um, that ice is always looking for um, you know new technology in which to invest in they had they had invested some uh, a small amount of money in, in in Coinbase, and they sold that when it came public. They realized a nine hundred million dollar profit, and along those the ways of you know always looking forward and being forward thinking, they recently purchased a stake in a company called T Zero. It's an alternative trading system, and all they focus on stocks trading on the blockchain. So this is an, another example of ICE, you know, looking forward and probably you know maybe someday that all stocks will eventually trade on the blockchain. Another another company that we look in the financial services for you know increasing their dividend they recently increased it 15% to 38 cents for a yield of approximately 1.2% and we have a target price on ICE of $148. With that I will turn it over to uh, John. Thank you, Kevin, and thanks again everybody for um, joining us today. We'll switch gears a little bit and talk about uh, the other main risk that investors are facing right now, and that is the impact of the Russian invasion on Ukraine. So um, I wanted to start off by talking about the overall global economic impact of the invasion. And, and I'll begin by saying that the Russian economy isn't necessarily Big. It's it's 1.7 trillion, but that compares to a 22 trillion dollar U.S. economy. Uh, the Russian population isn't exactly rich. Uh, 30,000 in purchasing power parity per year compares to 65 to 70,000 here in the U.S. And and the Russian economy wasn't really expected to grow very fast in 2022 anyway. Global forecast growth rate is about 4%. And prior to the invasion, um, the Russian forecast growth rate was 3%. So not very big, not very wealthy, not growing very fast. However, uh, the longer that the invasion continues, the bigger hit that we're going to see to global GDP growth. Probably in a couple of areas. Um, first, regionally, we would anticipate that Euro European economic economies are more at risk than in the US. Um, of the 1.7 trillion in Russian GDP, about a quarter of it is uh, exports. And while the US gets 4% of its exports from Russia, so not so much. Um, and our chart, we're looking at the major recipients of Russian exports and the European Union, China, um, and, and Western Europe uh, certainly uh, depend uh, pretty heavily on uh, Russian goods, particularly energy. And, and that's very true in, in Western Europe. So. What we've seen now is with the uh, threat of disruption of oil supplies, uh, the decision by the Biden administration to not purchase Russian oil, we've seen enormous volatility in the energy sector and in energy prices. And that's likely to have an impact, um, particularly in the U.S., on consumer spending as the price of gas in pumps rises and uh, American dollars are diverted more toward transportation and less toward shelter, food, leisure, and, and, and other factors. So we're anticipating a slowdown in first quarter GDP growth anyway. The first quarter started with the Omicron uh, variant 
It's going to end with this invasion. Fourth quarter growth was around 7%. We're looking for 1.9% growth um, in the U.S. in the first quarter. And a chunk of that is on uh, declining uh, consumer confidence and expected slowdown in growth in consumer spending. So uh, we do anticipate an impact globally uh, with higher oil prices leading to higher inflation, which was a problem anyway. Uh, the, we're due to get our consumer price index for February tomorrow. Uh, the forecast is for a, a top line number of 7.5% year over year inflation. Some are saying it could hit as high as, as 8%. Uh, perhaps these factors uh, encourage the Federal Reserve to move a little bit faster than, than we may be predicting now. That's hard to say. Uh, but this is where you're going to see the impact of the invasion. Not necessarily on overall global GDP growth, but in certain regions like Europe, in certain sectors like energy, and, and perhaps even in some U.S. consumer spending if um, consumer confidence remains low. Longer term, we think that what's happening now in Russia is part of a general trend toward deglobalization. And, and, and let me explain. For um, you know, much of the period post the collapse of the Berlin Wall, for probably 25 years, uh, we were in a period of globalization where countries became closer, trading partners, uh, companies were able to move manufacturing and production facilities and capabilities overseas where prices were lower. Um, by benefiting from lower prices, inflation came down, long-term interest rates came down, those are all good things in globalization. And now we're starting to reverse some of that. And this goes back, I think the first instance I can recall was when Scotland took a vote almost out of nowhere to leave Great Britain. And while that vote didn't pass, it came close. And sure enough, in about a year and a half later, the United Kingdom itself was pulling out of the European Union. Uh, so starting to deglobalize. President Trump took over at the White House here in the U.S. All of a sudden there are trade wars against our partners, Canada, Mexico, Europe, China, more deglobalization. COVID-19 emerges, travel restrictions are imposed. And now here we have this uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine. Again, just points to this deglobalization theme. So what we achieved through globalization will probably start to give back through deglobalization. Right now we see that as higher energy prices, right? Everybody sees that. But um, it could also be uh, future snarls in um, uh, uh, supply chain routes and longer term uh, persistent rises in labor wages and generally higher inflation going forward. And probably to go along with that, we would see higher interest rates. So that's not the uh, immediate impact of the Russian invasion, but the Russian invasion fits into a bigger theme that we're noticing that, that could lead to these challenges down the road. Okay, so let's uh, move on now to the industrial sector. Uh, this is a sector that has been in the news um, lately. It's a sector we recommend that clients overweight in the portfolios. It's not the biggest sector in the S&P 500. That would be technology. It's not the smallest sector. Uh, you know, that would be materials or utilities or real estate. But at 8%, it's um, in the middle of the pack. And it generally is part of investors' portfolios. It's a sector that is outperforming in 2022. It's down a little bit less than the market. 
it's being led by what's going on in the aerospace and defense sector, particularly in defense. Uh, for the industrial sector, aerospace and defense accounts for 20% of the sector market capitalization. And a, a lot of the opportunity in aerospace and defense comes from working with the U.S. Department of Defense. Um, U.S. spends $900 billion a year or is spending $900 billion a year on defense. And that's up 25% since when President Trump first took office. So uh, those numbers have been climbing. The global defense market is about $2 trillion a year. And we've listed some of the other big players, China, India, Russia at $62 billion, uh, top five, but uh, a small fraction of what the U.S. is spending at $900 billion a year. So um, looking ahead, we touched on the uh, topic of deglobalization already. We think that is likely to further accelerate this defense spending trend, and we think it also is going to place a renewed focus on rebuilding domestic supply chains. So I've got some stock picks here I will go over briefly. In aerospace and defense, um, Lockheed Martin is ticker symbol LMT. It's a $125 billion market cap company. It is the number one Department of Defense company. It's probably 85 to 90% linked to defense spending trends. Uh, there's a new CEO on board, and, and actually a year ago, he guided the Wall Street to slightly lower uh, revenue growth expectations, uh, primarily as the um, U.S. moves deeper into its F-35 contract, and, and that begins to dwindle. And before Lockheed Martin uh, really emerges in hypersonics, and space operations. So Lockheed Martin had been a value idea, and and now with the invasion of Russia, it has soared up um, sharply. It still uh, it is the value idea. The P.E. ratio is about 16 times. The dividend yield is 2.4% compared to 1.3% of um, yield for the S&P 500. The defense industry, generates a lot of cash, they buy back a lot of stock, they pay a lot of dividends, and Lockheed Martin most recently increases dividend 8% back in September 2021. That is one aerospace defense idea. A second idea is Raytheon Technologies, um, RTX. This is the largest market cap aerospace and defense company, and it's about 50-50, maybe 55-45, uh, 55 commercial aerospace exposure, 45% um, Department of Defense. Raytheon is um, manufacturer of Pratt & Whitney engines for commercial airlines, also uh, Collins cockpit technologies. But then that's the old United Technologies business, and uh, Raytheon brings to the group its intelligence and space businesses and its missiles and defense businesses. Raytheon is the company in the defense sector that we think is going to grow the fastest in 2022, uh, single digit top line growth, but management is still taking costs out from the merger of Raytheon and United Technologies. So we're expecting to see good margin improvement. Uh, this company also buys back a lot of stock and increases dividends 7% about a year ago. Uh, I'll touch on general dynamics. That is a, um, another diversified aerospace and defense company. Uh, for defense, general dynamics builds tanks. It builds submarines. It has defense department information technology systems. And it manages, it manufactures the Gulf Stream jets. So if uh, Lockheed Martin was 85-15 and Raytheon was 50-50, General Dynamics is probably somewhere in between, maybe 25% Gulfstream and 75% Department of Defense. Gulfstream had been a problem, particularly early in the pandemic. It was not very good optics to be picking up your brand new 
uh, Gulfstream 600 while the rest of the world was sick. They've moved beyond that. Uh, aerospace revenue is growing again. The book to bill ratio is 1.7 to 1. The backlog is around 40%. And again, it's offering some value here with a PE of 18 and a dividend yield of 2.1%. Of Moving on to the supply chain, I'll touch on uh, Old Dominion Freightline. This is one of our, our favorite supply chain ideas. It's a leading uh, less than truckload uh, trucking company. And that's a very fragmented business, a lot of opportunity for Old Dominion to take share. Uh, the company is a premium operator in this group. What does that mean? That means uh, it charge high prices. And why can it charge high prices? Because it has the best on-time delivery record in the industry. Also has the um, lowest slippage shrinkage ratio. So when you hire Old Dominion to carry your freight, you're going to get it on time and the load is going to be intact. Uh, company generates a lot of cash with its high prices, reinvests in its network to continue to improve its service. Also is a consistent double digit revenue, earnings per share, and dividend grower and market outperformer. Now Old Dominion and JB Hunt, uh, another trucking company we like, um, are still about 20% below their all time highs. While a lot of people have jumped onto aerospace and defense and have moved the aerospace and defense stocks back up to 52 week highs. So better values, in the trucking area and in the rails i'll just touch quickly um recent upgrade on canadian national inc ticker symbol cni you can read our report in the report section of yahoo finance so um the russian exports are big in energy big in commodities big in grain and those are canadian national railways top categories petroleum metals and grain Canadian National lost out in a bidding war for Kansas City Southern. That's okay. Management can focus on operations. Companies forecasting 20% earnings per share growth in 2022. Jim earlier talked about double digit as uh, the market average. So better than average earnings growth at Canadian National. Also recently increased the dividend 19%. Confidence in the outlook. And then Union Pacific, we recently raised our target price on this one. Also a big shipper of grain and coal. Double digit dividend hike back in December 2021. Management focused on shareholder returns by buying back 5% of stock each year. And Jim, with that, I will turn the call back to you. John, thank you very much. We really do appreciate that from you and Steve, Kevin. As well, we have we have some time to get some calls, so let's get to them now. The first one to get to, John, you mentioned uh, uh, industrials being overweighted, and, and one of our listeners confessed to being what quote a newbie, saying they didn't understand what Argus meant when they talked about underweighted, overweighted, and market weighted. So a quick primer on that, um, and we're talking about equity only portfolios, the equity only holdings that you have. If you were to look at the S and P 500, you would discover that and divided into a pie chart that approximately i want to say 26 to 29 percent of the market capitalization is in technology about 14 15 percent is in healthcare about 13 percent in financial services and on down the line we have smaller sectors such as utilities materials and REITs that are less than 3% of the market. So when Argus says we recommend an overweight position in, in such and such sector, what we're suggesting is you take that S&P market weight and you wanna add a percentage point or two in your own portfolio. So if the market weight in financial services is 13% on the S&P 500, we're recommending that investors in a normal equity only portfolio are gonna have approximately 15% of their holdings in uh, in financial services, so a slight overweight. And if we say underweight in, uh, say, communication services and the communication services weighting within the S&P 500 is 11%, we're recommending that investors have maybe nine or 10% of their holdings in that sector. So that's a simple uh, overview of that sector. 
And uh, one of the, since I've got the, the, the horn right here, another question we had was simply, um, the, in terms of the energy sector, um, when the energy oil prices go up, does that mean higher earnings and better performance for stocks like Chevron and XOM? Uh, that's Exxon Mobil. And my, our answer to that is very much so, yes. And those are two uh, buy rated recommendations in the in a large cap part of our overweighted recommended energy sector. And the simple answer, the reason is, is that um, extraction costs for these companies are relatively stable. Uh, and what they've done is over the years, they've gotten away from low return assets such as deep sea uh, assets that need to be extracted deep at sea and have gone to a more attractive assets in some of the basins and shales in the U.S., for example, and in other places, uh, Permian and Eagle Fur, these sort of places. Now, on a 10-year average basis, um, the, the price for West Texas crude, which is the benchmark in the U.S., has generally been in the 50 to 70 percent range. Uh, maybe nine years ago, it was a little bit higher. It came down to that kind of 50 to 70 percent range prevailing from most of the past decade, and then of course in 2020, it went down all the way to $20 and even below. Um, a year ago at this time, oil prices, West Texas was trading around 65, and now it's effectively doubled off that level. So these companies were making money in, uh, in as 21, 2021 progressed, um, and the oil price kept rising, and now we've seen something like a spike. So given that these companies have worked very hard to be profitable at much lower extraction costs, giving much lower energy costs, they're going to be uh, reaping some windfall profits here at these current high levels. And that's why you can see why uh, investors have been favoring oil stocks. And that's why the energy sector is the only sector on the S&P 500 that's doing very well this year. So now I have a couple more questions. And I'll, I'll turn our attention. We have we have some so-called other picks in the financial service sectors. And, and Kevin, I want to ask you a question. Um, of all the recommendations we have today, there's one area of the market that investors may be a little less familiar with, and that is the mortgage REITs. Um, we, you know, Argus has uh, coverage of REITs that across a variety of, of areas that would include, you know, uh, apartment REITs and office building REITs and public storage REITs and shopping mall REITs, you name it. Uh, but there's less understanding of the mortgage REITs if they're an income investment, uh, what their growth profile is. So if you could just talk a little bit about that, Kevin. Uh, we, I think our, our listeners would really appreciate that. Yeah, sure, Jim. Um, yeah, the, the the mortgage, we'll call them mortgage securities REITs are, uh, you know, it, it definitely a different kind of animal. You have uh, Annaly, NLY, AGNC, also AGNC symbol. Uh, you have uh, New Res, um, <clears throat> New Residential, NRZ. What they do is they, they purchase mortgage securities that are predominantly guaranteed by the agencies, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, and Ginny Mae. So they will buy those securities and then um, leverage those securities out in the uh, repo market. So um, they'll lend out those securities and they collect a fee so that, so they can, their leverage is usually between five to eight times of the amount of mortgages they own. So that's how they're able to generate the uh, dividend yields that are between right now between nine and twelve percent. So it's taking government-backed mortgage securities and leveraging those in the financing market, and and taking the spread at which they earn on the security versus the spread that it costs them to fund those securities. So um, they've taken a, a a bit of a hit with them with the uh, government un, unwinding its uh, purchases of mortgage securities. So that's caused the value of the securities to decline. So that affects their book value. But you know, they they do they do definitely earn well above what they pay out in dividends. So we believe that dividends are secure at these at this level. And the recent backup in the in the prices of, of these three mortgage REITs that, as I'll repeat, use leverage in order to generate these above market uh, dividend yields um, re represent uh, an attractive opportunity right now to look at some higher yielding stocks, but it's, you know, preface that against, you know, you could have a declining book value uh, in the securities, um, but they've done a pretty good job of hedging off their interest rate risk, you know, probably around the 
levels of 70 to 80 percent that they've hedged off the the risk in their portfolios so we believe that these uh, leveraged REITs uh, do represent um, an opportunity for um, income income oriented investors uh, to take a look at see another question for you uh, we've got several uh, on the other uh, the, the other page uh, the additional stock picks page we have a, a variety of uh, payment processors and credit card companies and obviously they had a, there was a surge in non-cash purchases when everyone went to Amazon Prime and other online shopping services during the, the worst of the pandemic now as people are going back uh, to you know mall shopping and out on the streets and whatnot are the trends still strong at these uh, payment processors what, what's the outlook there yeah, I think it is, Jim. You know, they have pulled back, and I, I guess part of that is uh, because the a reversal of, of the stay-at-home trends. Um, but if you think about what's going on as a secular trend in the, in the payments uh, space is that, uh, you know, a lot more migration to online, uh, a lot of uh, recognition by consumers that uh, spending on credit cards is a uh, is a good thing for, you know, one, one less trip to the ATM to, to pick up cash. Uh, you get rewards when when you spend um, uh, with credit cards, uh, travel, cash back, that sort of thing. Um, you also, uh, you know, for safety, um, credit card gets stolen. You're not responsible for any any payments, unlike cash, where you'll you know never get it back. Um, so safety, convenience, uh, rewards uh, programs, uh, just not not having to carry uh, cash. Some people don't need to carry a credit card; they just carry the cell phone and. Uh, can can transact that way. Uh, so I think that's just a, a long uh, secular uh, trend. We're you know in the very early uh, stages still uh, with that globally. I think the number is about 80% um, of spending volumes are still done via uh, either cash or or checks. So I think that uh, that get get phases out, and that's one of the reasons why you've seen some pretty consistent growth from the likes of Mastercard, Visa, growing kind of in that low teens pace every single year. So it's it's a pretty pretty hearty uh, growth rate, and I think the uh, you know more recent sort of uh, bit of bit of unwinding of the, of the payment services, I think, will be uh, the, the stocks and the I should say in the payment services space will be uh, more short-lived, and uh, and the trends are behind them. So as you can see on this page and other page, we have lots and lots of stock ideas in all these different financial services niches, and John included lots of lots and lots of stock ideas in all the industrial niches and. A reminder that our uh, Yahoo Finance Plus subscribers have access to all these Argus reports. These are in-depth reports that reflect the Argus six-point system. And, you know, lots of color to follow up with any of these companies that we're recommending today. I think we have time for one more question, and I'm actually going to put it uh, to all three of you, uh, whoever feels best qualified to answer it. It's simply that uh, if, if the Fed does indeed raise rates and, and rolls off their uh, MBSs off their balance sheet and long-term rates rise as well, you know, what does that do to housing demand and the housing prices as, as mortgage rates rise? And is there, is there, you know, does this mean eventually lower housing prices, higher housing prices? What, what is the, what are your feelings on this? Hey, it's, it's Kevin. I'll take that uh, uh, part of it. Um, you know, mortgage origination is expected to be half of what it was last year. We're in a purchase market, but for the consumer, you still have a, the amount of housing stock or the homes that are available um, is still very, very low. Uh, you have, you probably will see some more folks actually staying in their homes. Uh, you might see some improvements to their homes, whether it's, uh, you know, putting on a new home office if, if they're working from home. So you might see some, you know, additional cash out refis, but, you know, the, the, with the amount of housing that's available right now and, and so low, uh, you know, we don't see in particular, any any hiccups right now in in the housing market? It's it's a you know people that are buying their homes are definitely you know moving into them. They're not buying in them on on, on speculation, uh, looking to flip them. So uh, you know and the other issue is that if someone wants to sell their house, are they you know where are they going to move to? Uh, you know if maybe they're moving to a completely different geographic area and looking for a, a lifestyle change, but you know, just if your home is up in value, that probably means that the home that you would be looking to buy is also up in value. So it might not be quite affordable yeah. to, in order to sell your house. So um, with the low housing stock right now, I think, the, you know, the housing sector is 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 poised to remain 
you know, at these levels, at least for the foreseeable future. Great. Well, thank you. So thanks everyone for dialing in today. Thanks to John, Kevin, Stephen for uh, your your insights and your thoughts today. Again, I'll steer you back to the Yahoo Finance Plus website where you can find all this terrific Argus content, uh, di deep dives on every one of these companies uh, and industries, and uh, you know many many more features. So. With that, I will uh, wish everyone a good day, and until next time, uh, so long.